Good evening, everyone. The time now is eight o'clock, and just uh, want to say a very warm welcome to almost two hundred people in the webinar room, and about seventeen of you watching in YouTube. Okay, so for those of you who are watching in YouTube, you might want to come inside the webinar room so that you can ask questions later. Otherwise, if you are watching over YouTube, you can only be. Uh, watching. <laughs> All right. So uh, just a quick intro. My name is Richard and I am from Online Traders Club Singapore or short form OTCS. Okay. Before we bring on today's uh, speakers, please allow me to do a quick introduction of the club. OTCS. Okay, so uh, you have already seen this notice on the slide for a while. I hope you also enjoyed the music. So don't forget to subscribe to the mailing list at the goodinvestors.sg. Okay, and while you're doing that, also please join the OTCS Telegram channel. Uh, online traders club you can search for that in telegram and you'll be kept posted of our upcoming workshops and webinars okay so you can also subscribe to our mailing list at our website okay let me now go on to introduce the club Okay, Online Traders Club Singapore, or OTCS for short, is a non-profit society formed in 2005. And we are a community of traders and investors. Okay. And to me, OTCS stands for a place where we network, share, and learn. And we do it through a series of workshops and webinars, such as the one you're attending now, courses, and a library. For workshops and webinars, we aim to have about 10 to 12 a year, and we normally hold it in person, and we also normally provide dinner. But because of the COVID situation, we've decided to bring everything online, and we also make it free for all. So that's why you're here, right? And for causes, uh, oh, this one is one of the uh, in-person workshops that we held at the beginning of this year which is uh, sponsored by SGX and SOCGEN, and it was very well attended. So for these workshops and, call, uh, workshops and webinars, we will invite experts from all kinds of financial uh, domains to share with our attendees and members about their knowledge and expertise. For causes, we aim to have about three to six a year. And what we do here is that uh, we will normally go to a trainer and then we will say uh, do a group buy so we can bargain a better price for our members to attend. As for our library, we have about $6,000 worth of resources uh, that our members can borrow for free. So if you'd like to find out what they are, you can go over to our website Go to the library section and the details are there. So OTCS is a place where we network, share and learn and we do it through a series of workshops, webinars, courses and our library. So if you would like to join us, the price, the normal price is $120 a year and for a limited time only, you can have it for just $60 a year. Now, if you join us for our in-person workshops 12 times a year and you have our dinner, basically, you know, your club membership is free already or your dinner is free, depending on how you look at it, all right? So to find out more details about how to join us, please go to our website, onlinetradersclub.org. Now, again, to find out what are the upcoming uh, webinars and workshops and courses, please join our Telegram channel, Online Traders Club. Look for that inside your Telegram or subscribe to our mailing list at our website. Now, the club is not just run by the committee. We are also supported by a group of good friends who are also members, and they uh, help us to do many things behind the scenes in order for us to run successful in-person events. So a big shout out to them and a big thank you to them. Now, a very important disclaimer, you're responsible for your own profits and losses. Speakers' opinions are their own and does not represent OTCS opinions. 
OTCS is office holders, associates, sponsors are not responsible for nor liable for your losses. OTCS events are for educational purposes and should not be construed as advice. And when in doubt, please seek professional help. Now with that out of the way, I just want to say that there will be a Q&A segment at the end of the speaker's uh, main presentation. And so if you have any questions, please hold it until the end, okay? And then you can ask those questions by typing into the chat box. Now, depending on the devices you're watching this webinar from, you can scroll down and you will see a chat box there. So that's where you can type in your questions. And at the end, uh, Sergin and Jeremy will answer them. Ah, talking about uh, Sergi and Jeremy, this is how they look like. They look half my age. <laughs> Just kidding. And uh, they are the owner and bloggers at the goodinvestors.sg. So if you have not visited, please go and visit it and join the mailing list there. They write very, very well because they were writers from uh, full, Motley Fool Singapore. So yeah. Okay, so later late, maybe they'll share a bit more about their background. Okay, and I also intentionally put there that this photo was taken before 7 April. Uh, you know why, right? Because after that, cannot go for copy. Yeah. <laughs> because of social distancing, right? Okay. All right, so yeah, this is another shout out for everyone to please visit their blog, excellent blog with great articles about finance at the goodinvestors.sg and subscribe to their mailing list to be kept posted of their analysis and writings. So without further ado, I want to present uh, our special speakers for tonight to share with us how to find long-term investment opportunities during this COVID crisis. Now, investment is not trading. Uh, so a lot of people will be wanting to buy low, sell high, correct? So buy low. When the crash came just a couple of weeks ago, wow, 20, 30, 40% drop got the emotion uh, and the mental capacity to buy low or not. I don't know about you, la, but I damn scared. <laughs> okay, so these two youngsters, uh, they may look young in their age, but they are pregnant with wisdom about investing. So without further ado, can I hand over the mic to Sergin? Please remember to unmute yourself and then you can take over the screen, all right? Uh, hello, hello. Uh, yes, we can hear you. All right, fantastic. Uh, hi everyone, good evening. Let me just uh, share my uh, slides first. Okay, so, um, all right, uh, I like to start my presentations by thanking people. Um, so first, uh, I'd like to thank uh, all of you for spending this uh, lovely Thursday evening to join Jeremy and myself at this uh, webinar. Um, I, I also want to thank uh, Online Traders Club for organizing this event. Uh, they took charge of all the logistics very well. So if you are watching this, um, please give them a round of applause in the comfort of own homes. Um, the second thing I like to do um, at my presentations is that uh, I like to uh, share disclaimers. So um, please do not take anything I say today to be financial advice. Uh, the information I'm sharing is purely um, educational. Yep. So here's here's a um, very quick uh, run through of tonight of the structure of tonight's uh, webinar. There are six sections in all. Uh, the first is an introduction of um, Jeremy and myself, for people who don't really know us. Um, the second is to let you understand what the stock market really is. Uh, Jen is actually talking about the key mindsets we need to have to be successful um, investing. Um, the fourth section is um, me talking about my investment framework and how we can actually use it um, to build uh, a robust uh, investment portfolio 
Now, the framework I'm sharing is something that I have been using in my own personal and professional investment activities uh, for many years. Um, the fifth section of the webinar would actually be about um, how we can use my framework to find opportunities during this particular um, COVID-19 uh, crisis. And then the last section would actually be a Q&A. Um, Jeremy will be participating in the Q&A, but uh, for the presentation itself, it would just be uh, it would just be me. So um, the second and third sections of this presentation are actually like really important. They form the foundation uh, for your investing success. Um, you know, we, we can be the best financial analyst in the world, but if we do not have the correct mindset or the right understanding of what uh, stocks are, um, I think it's really difficult to be a successful investor. Um, investing is something that's simple, but not easy. It's simple because we don't need any um, fancy math uh, or we don't need any... Um, uh, complex knowledge to invest well, but it's also not um, rocket science, right? Um, the, it, and we really need a good control of our emotions uh, when we're investing. So the second and third sections of the presentation are what I think can hopefully help us better uh, master um, our emotions. So um, the, allow me to introduce uh, myself and, and Jeremy. Um, the, so I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, my name is Serging. I started investing in the US stock market for my family nearly 10 years ago in October 2010. Um, I actually studied engineering in the National University of Singapore, NUS, and I graduated in 2012. Um, during uni, I already kind of knew that I wanted a career in investing. So in January 2013, I managed to join the Motley Fool Singapore as an investment writer. And then in May 2016, I became a co-leader of the company's investing team all the way to uh, my departure in October 2019. So uh, Jeremy, Jeremy Chia is my longtime friend. Uh, we have known each other since we were 17 or 18 years old and uh, we are currently 33. Um, so Jeremy actually graduated with a medical degree from the University of Western Australia in 2014, uh, but he did not really want to be a doctor. So he came back to Singapore shortly after graduation and kind of fell in love with investing. So um, in June 2017, he joined uh, the Motley Fool um, Singapore uh, and uh, as a writer and, and he was really prolific. So by the time uh, the Motley Fool Singapore closed in October 2019, Jeremy already had written more than a thousand articles covering many different types of uh, investment topics, you know, REITs, uh, banks, general investing, all kinds of stuff. So um, he's currently at level two of the CFA program, the Chartered Financial Analyst Program. So. Um, through my years of a um, professional and personal investing activities, I've developed an investment framework, which uh, I'm going to share later. The framework has helped me produce uh, an annual return of about 18%. That's the blue line in the, in the chart uh, from October 2010, which is the day I started to today. Um, and I do not actually count my dividends. So this is the, uh, the, the portfolio that I helped my family run. And the performance is far ahead of the 11.8% annual return with dividends uh, that the S&P 500 has actually produced. So that's the orange line in the chart. And the S&P 500 is actually the major uh, stock market benchmark in the US. Uh, and the performance of my portfolio actually includes you know, the incredible volatility that, uh, that we experienced in late February and March this year. Um, I am a uh, very patient long-term investor. I almost never sell and I try to buy good companies to keep them. So uh, companies that I've invested in in October 2010, in 2011, in 2012, and so on, uh, I, uh, I still own them today in the, in the portfolio. So the result that you see, the blue line, is basically me finding good companies and holding on to their shares uh, for the long run. And it, it, it is just that simple and stress-free, and it's something that I'm quite proud of. Uh, my investment framework also guided my investment process in my time at the Motley Fool Singapore. Um, I used my framework to help me pick stocks from around the world for the company's flagship investment newsletter, Stock Advisor Gold. Um, in the newsletter, we actually recommended two stocks per month, one from Singapore and one from international markets, including the US, UK, Malaysia, and Hong Kong. Um, the newsletter nearly doubled the global stock market's return over a 3.5-year period, so that would be May 2016 to October 2019. We produced a 30.6% uh, average return for the recommendations we made versus just 16.4% for the global stock market. 
Um, and this is also something that I am um, uh, uh, really proud of. So today, um, Jeremy and I, we run an investment blog called The Good Investors uh, that Richard mentioned. Um, it is our personal investing blog and where we want to share our investing thoughts freely um, with the public. We believe that um, investor education is something really meaningful. And so the blog is a way for us to just share our investing thoughts and to uh, help promote and improve investor education um, in Singapore. Um, Jeremy and I are also um, in the process of setting up an investment fund named the Compounder Fund. And the primary objective of the Compounder Fund are to build wealth for investors in Singapore and to give back to society. The fund will be investing in stocks around the world. So um, what I talk about today, uh, the slides that I'm showing, uh, they will all be on the good investors uh, in the coming days. So, you know, if you actually miss something, uh, do not worry about it. You can actually go back and, and look at it um, in a few days time. So let me move on to the second section of today's presentation, which is understanding the stock market. Um, so the very first stock market in the world was created in Amsterdam in the 1600s. So that's a few hundred years ago. And of course, uh, many things have actually changed uh, about the financial markets and about the global economy. But one thing has remained constant about the stock market. And it is effectively still a place to buy and sell um, pieces of the business. Right? And I think having this understanding of the stock market leads me to the next logical thought, which is that a stock will typically do well over time if its underlying business does well too. So this actually makes um, investing something simple to understand because it means that you know, if we have to be investing for the long run with an investing time horizon measured in years, because that is the way that we can take advantage of this simple relationship in the stock market that a stock price will do well over time if its underlying business does well too. So over the short run, the, the stock market is governed by all kinds of uh, uh, emotions of uh, millions of investors that are in the world. And, and it is not something that is easily predictable or something that is easily understood. Uh, and so this is why I actually uh, fall back upon uh, the, the long run relationship between stock prices and businesses, because that is something that I think is easy to grasp and easy uh, to understand. So now I need um, you guys to uh, do something for me, all of you who are listening. So I would like you to think about this, you know, if uh, you would like to have uh, Warren Buffett, Mark Zuckerberg, and Jeff Bezos uh, run a business for you. You know, you don't even have to do anything. Uh, we have these great business leaders helping run the companies for us. And all we do is we are, we are a silent partner for them, right? So. I think many of us may not realize this, but the stock market actually allows us to do just that. We can be silent partners alongside the best business leaders in the world. Now, Warren Buffett's company, um, Berkshire Hathaway, is actually a fantastic example of this uh, thing that I just talked about. So, um, you know, from for, the, from for the 53 years, from 1965 to 2018, Berkshire Hathaway's book value, which is its assets less liabilities, it's actually increased by 18.7% per year. Um, and over the same period, its share price has actually increased by 20.5% per year. So we have to recognize that those 53 years between 20, 1965 and 2018 actually included the Vietnam War, the Black Monday stock market crash, the breaking of the Bank of England, the Asian and the bursting of the dot-com bubble. You know, um, th there are all kinds of uh, financial uh, crises and, and important events that have happened in the world, uh, but an 18.7% input has still led to a 20.5% output. And, you know, this 20.5% output uh, over many years, over 53 years, actually turns a $1,000 investment into $19.6 million. So um, this is... Uh, so. We are now moving on to section three of the presentation, which is like the mindsets that we need to talk about. So to kick it off, right, I want to play a very quick game again. So this time, right, I want you to um, think about, to think for yourself, you know, which of two stocks you would actually like to invest in. Um, there are two stocks here we're talking about. One is ABC and one is DEF. So let's talk about stock ABC first. So stock ABC was listed in 1997. Um, from then to 2018, 
um, its share price had suffered a top to bottom decline in every year that ranged from 13% to 83%. So if I put it in another way, right, stock ABC has actually experienced a double digit top to bottom decline in every single year from 1997 to 2018. So now let's look at stock DEF. No, it, uh, it was also listed in 1997 and the chart actually shows stock DEF's share price uh, growing by 76,000% from $2 in 1997 to $1,500 in 2018. So I think, you know, it's very obvious um, that uh, DEF has actually been an incredible uh, long-term winner. So with this information, uh, I'd like to uh, get all of you to spend a few seconds thinking, you know, would you like to invest in ABC or DEF? So again, uh, ABC is the one that has seen this tremendous declines in the share price uh, every single year uh, from 1997 to 2018. And DEF is the one that has increased tremendously over the same period of time. So which one would you guys like? Okay. So just a few seconds uh, for you guys to think. Um, Right, so let me just reveal stock DEF first, right? And as a um, reminder, it is the stock with the 76,000% gain, and it is actually Amazon, which is the e-commerce giant uh, that is that uh, was co-founded and run and currently run by uh, Jeff Bezos. Right, and now here is the review for ABC. So stock ABC is actually also Amazon. So what we see here is that ABC and DEF are actually the very same stock, right? And I think that this amazing experience that Amazon has delivered for shareholders is why Peter Lynch uh, once said that, you know, in the stock market, the most important organ is the stomach, it's not the brain, right? Peter Lynch is actually the legendary fund manager of the Fidelity Magellan Fund uh, who produced a fantastic return, which I'll be talking about a bit later. So the important thing here in the, in the market is that, you know, we need the stomach to be able to withstand volatility, which is like the, the ups and downs of stock prices. Because as Amazon has shown, right, even the best long-term winners in the stock market have also suffered from um, sharp short-term declines. So a very important uh, mindset that um, we need to have in stocks. And that is the first mindset is that, Volatility in stocks is a feature, uh, not a bug. When stocks go through the ups and downs, you know, it's not a sign um, that something is broken. So that's the very first mindset that we should have. Right? The volatility in stocks is a feature, not a bug. So some of you may uh, ask, you know, why are market crashes so common? So for this, we actually have to visit the theories of the late economist uh, Hyman Minsky. When Minsky was alive, uh, he was actually an obscure economist, um, and he only became well known after the great financial crisis of 2007 and 2009. Now, the reason is because, um, excuse me, um, the reason is because Minsky actually had a framework for understanding why economies go through boom bust cycles. So, according to him, stability is destabilizing. So, if an economy does not suffer a recession for a long period of time, people actually feel safe. And it is this safety or this illusion of safety that causes people to take on more risk, such as borrowing more, which leads to the system becoming fragile. And so what Minsky is saying is that literally, the lack of a recession plants the seeds for the next recession. So Minsky's ideas, right, were actually talking about um, economies, but I think they can also be applied to stocks. So, you know, let's assume that uh, stocks are now guaranteed to grow by 9% per year. Now, in this uh, uh, hypothetical scenario, uh, what would happen? Now, to me, I think the only logical result would be that people would just keep paying up for stocks, you know, to the point that stocks become too expensive to return 9% a year. Or, or people would actually take on too much risk, such as borrow borrowing a lot of money to invest in stocks. You know, because they have this perception that uh, stocks are guaranteed to give 9% per year returns. But the truth is that there are no guarantees in this world. There's only this perception of a guarantee. And bad things happen in the real world, and they happen often. So when stocks are priced for perfection, um, the emergence of any bad news would actually lead uh, to lower stock prices. So um, 
now we're talking about the second mindset. Um, and so the thing about us as human beings is that we cannot run from the fact that uh, we are emotional creatures. You know, when stocks fall, even with the knowledge that volatility is merely a feature of financial markets, it hurts. And when it hurts, that is when we can make stupid mistakes. So I talked about Peter Lynch earlier. So the reason why Peter Lynch is a legend is because from 1997 to 1990, the years when he was an active uh, professional investor, Peter Lynch actually generated an annual return of 29% for Fidelity Magellan Fund. Now, what this means is that every $100,000 invested with Peter Lynch in 1997 would have grown to become $2.7 million by 1990. Uh, but the amazing thing about Peter Lynch's performance is that the average investor in his fund actually made only 7% per year within the same time frame. And the difference in returns is drastic because, excuse me, if you invest at 7% per year for 13 years, $1,000 would become just $240,000 as compared to $2.7 million that you could have gotten if you had generated a 29% uh, annual return. So the, the discrepancy in the returns between Peter Lynch and his average investors was more than 10 times. Now, and, and the problem really is that um, money would flow out of the Magellan Fund when Peter Lynch encountered a temporary setback and money would actually flow back in only when Peter Lynch got back on track. So if, you, if we look at this from, in, from another angle, it means that the investors in Fidelity Magellan Fund actually bought high and sold, sold low. Um, so I think there is actually a great way for us to think about um, volatility in the financial markets so that we can minimize its damage. And this is something that uh, was recently shared by Morgan Housel, one of, the, one of my favorite uh, finance writers. And so Morgan Housel said that, you know, instead of thinking or seeing short-term volatility in the stock market as a fine, think of it as a fee for something worthwhile, which is great long-term returns. You know, when we think about fines, we see them as a uh, punishment for doing something wrong. You know, in Singapore, there are traffic fines, there are legal fines. When we litter on the streets, we get fined. And now if we break our circuit breaker, uh, we get fined or maybe even jailed. So there are a lot of um, fines that we pay when we actually end up doing uh, something wrong, right? But the what uh, Morgan Housel tells us is that we can actually think of the stock market, think of volatility as a fee for something great. You know, when we pay fees, we actually pay to get something worthwhile in return, right? We pay a fee for a movie ticket. We pay a fee for a concert. We pay medical fees uh, for doctors to treat our illnesses. So this way, I think, of framing volatility in the stock market is actually a very healthy way for us to be thinking about um, the ups and downs in the stock market. So if we think of volatility as, as paying a fee for something worthwhile, then I think it makes it a lot more emotionally acceptable when we encounter uh, periods of volatility in the financial markets. So this is the second important um, mindset that I think investors uh, should have, or rather all of us uh, should have. So um, I think some of us also might be thinking, you know, is this fee really worthwhile paying? Um, so we saw in the case of Amazon that, that short-term volatility, the fee, was actually definitely worth paying because over the long run, um, the Amazon generated tremendous returns for its investors. And what I want to say is that actually the point that I made about Amazon can actually also be applied to the broader uh, US market as well. So again, data from Morgan Housel shows us you know, how often the US market has fallen by a certain percentage. Um, and we are looking at data from 2018 to 2013, sorry, from 1928 to 2013. So that's a period of about 85 years, uh, a long period of time. And we can see that you know, when the S&P 500 declines by 10% from top to bottom, this happens at once every 11 months on average. And there's a 20% decline once every two years on average. There's a 30% decline once every 10 years. And then there is a 50% decline two to three times per century. So, you know, we can see that this kind, this kind of short-term declines in the US stock market has actually been something very um, common. But so let's see how American stocks have done over the same period of time, right? So, you know, based on data from Robert Schiller, 
we can see that the S&P 500, you know, after we include dividends and after we take away inflation, has actually generated a 21,000% return from 1928 to 2013. So it means that you know, every thousand dollars that we invested in 1928 would have become $210,000 by 2013. So I think that the S&P 500 has definitely charged investors a very expensive um, uh, entry fee in the form of volatility. But I also think that you know it has actually generated something spectacular. And so what I've shared about the second mindset and that you have seen with the S&P 500, I think it's also a great reminder of the very first mindset that we should have that volatility in stocks is a feature um, and not a bug. So now the third mindset. Um, there, is a, there is a common misconception that I encounter often about the stock market and it is that what goes up must come, come down. Um, while it is true that there is some form of uh, cyclicality with stocks, but I think and a very important point is also often missed, and it is that stocks go up a lot more than they come down. And um, you know, I talked about Amazon earlier, uh, as well as the uh, uh, S&P 500. So maybe now we can see uh, it with uh, stocks all over the world. So the chart that I'm showing now actually plots the returns of the stock markets from developed economies and developing economies over more than 110 years. So the time frame we're looking at is uh, 1900 to 2013. So in that time frame, uh, stocks in developed economies, which is the blue line, um, they have actually generated an annual return of 8.3%. Whereas stocks in developing economies, uh, which is the red line, has actually generated a return of 7.4% per year. So, you know, we look at the chart and we can definitely see these like ups and downs. I think that it is also very clear that the long run trend is just a, a, a movement up and to the right, right? So this is like the, the third key mindset that we should have that, you know, what goes up does not come down permanently. But uh, there's also an important caveat to note here because, uh, and that is that diversification is crucial, which is which um, brings me to the uh, the fourth mindset. So you know there are a lot of uh, factors that can cause a single stock or a single country stock market to do poorly even after decades, and so these are uh, you know we can have devastation from war or natural disasters, uh, we can have corrupt or useless leaders, uh, we can have incredible overvaluation at a starting point. So you know. Um, talking about the incredible overvaluation, we can look at the case of Japan. Japan is one of, I think, the best cases of what can happen to investors uh, over a very long period of time if uh, because of uh, overvaluation. So what happened with Japan is that in the late 1980s and early 1990s, the Japanese stock market actually was in a tremendous bubble. Um, the, back then, uh, at the peak of, of its bubble, Japanese stocks were on average trading at about 100 times um, their 10-year uh, inflation-adjusted average earnings. So, you know, if, we, if I take the uh, average, if I take the earnings of Japanese stocks over the past 10 years and I average them and adjust for inflation, that number in um, Japanese stocks were actually worth uh, more than nearly 100 times that earnings number. And that is actually like a crazy overvaluation. And so what happened is that um, if somebody had actually bought Japanese stocks at the peak of its bubble in the late 19, in late 1989 or early 1990 um, and held them to today, um, the person would still be down by about 40%, 40. So we're talking about 1989 to 2020, so that's something like 30 over years. Um, and so, you know, um, when you buy stocks at, at very high valuations, that is when, you know, we can invite trouble to our portfolios. So this is why I think the fourth mindset is important, which is diversification. You know, we want to diversify uh, geographically um, and across industries because we want to protect our portfolios from risk that can happen to say one particular company or one particular sector or one particular country. By spreading our portfolio across the world, we can protect ourselves against such risks. Right, so now uh, the fifth mindset. Um, at the end of 2019, um, China actually alerted the World Health Organization about cases of pneumonia 
uh, that were amongst its citizens that were caused by an unknown virus. And that was actually the very first view that the world had of uh, the pandemic that we're experiencing today, which is COVID-19. So, um, you know, COVID-19 has caused many economies around the world to slow tremendously. Um, and countries across the world are in some form of lockdown um, everywhere, you know, including us in Singapore. We are going through this circuit um, breaker period at the moment, which is why we are doing a webinar instead of uh, an in-person um, seminar. So, you know, with this backdrop of um, COVID, we are clearly uh, living in um, uncertain times, you know. But there is a interesting thought, and that is that, you know, should we be investing in uncertain times? Um, and I think that the answer is actually yes, because I want you to now, you know, um, think about something for me. And that is, you know, if I were to ask you, um, you know, if I were to tell you that in one single year, the price of oil was spiked, and the US will go to war in the Middle East, and its economy will actually experience a recession, all of these in one single year. You know, how do you think the US market will fare over the next five years, over the next 30 years? Um, so take a few seconds to think about this, you know, how would US stocks do if in one single year, you know, all of these things happened, uh, there's a huge spike in the price of oil, the country goes to war and there's a recession that happens, right? Um, and what is interesting, is that the events that I mentioned actually all happened in 1990. So the price of oil actually spiked in August 1990, the same month that the US went into an actual war in the Middle East. And in July 1990, the US actually entered a recession. So, you know, based on data from Robert Schiller, the S&P 500 was actually up by nearly 80% from the start of 1990 to the end of 1995. And this includes dividends and after inflation. So stocks were up by 80%, which is a really decent uh, rate of return. We are talking about something around 8% per year analyzed. Um, so I think this is a really, uh, sorry, I, I think we're talking about something like 12% uh, uh, analyzed um, over five year periods. And this is something that has happened even though the US encountered all kinds of tremendous uh, troubles at the start of the um, measurement period, right? And if you look at, say, from the start of uh, 1990 to um, the end of uh, 2019, US stocks were actually up by about nearly 800%. Uh, so, and there's this other fascinating aspect of um, the, the US market, um, and it is that it has actually experienced multiple crises every single year from 1990 to today. And this can be seen in the table uh, that I'm showing. Um, I'm not sure if you guys can see it clearly, but what it shows is that you know there, there has been tremendous amounts of uh, crises that has happened every single year uh, across the world. There have always been something to um, worry about. And uh, this actually brings me to the fifth mindset, which is that, you know, um, uncertainty is always around, but we should definitely still invest. So I started talking about the fifth mindset by discussing uh, COVID-19. And I actually think that, you know, it would be appropriate to also show how st uh, stock markets around the world have actually performed after the occurrence of other deadly disease outbreaks in the past. So um, the chart that I'm about to show, uh, it's actually prepared by Market Watch, and it shows the performance of the MSCI World Index from 1970 to February 2020. So you know there have been multiple global epidemics in the past 50 years, um, but that has actually not prevented uh, stocks around the world from actually growing over time. So. Um, to repeat again, you know, uncertainty is always around, uh, but that does not mean that we should not um, invest. So um, now we are talking about the sixth mindset, uh, which is the importance of expecting but not predicting. So um, market crashes and recessions are actually bound to happen periodically. Uh, we have seen that in the data that I presented earlier. But the, the interesting thing 
or rather the important thing is that we don't know when these crashes you know will occur if we are investing for many years uh, we should count on things to get ugly a few times at the very least um, and this is actually very different from saying that uh, uh, there's a recession in the US that will happen in the uh, third quarter of 2020 and then you know we position our portfolios to fit this view uh, and it may seem trivial but actually there's a very important difference between expecting and predicting now the difference lies in our behavior and because you know if we merely expect downturns to happen from time to time we won't actually be surprised uh, when they happen and so what this means is that our portfolios would also be built to be able to handle a wide range of outcomes but the, the problem is that if we are trying to predict, then we think we know when something will happen and we try to act on that. And so what this means is that our portfolios may actually only be suited to uh, do well in only a narrow range of situations. And if a different outcome actually happens, then our portfolios would actually be, uh, would actually not do uh, well at all. So that is the important thing about, you know, expecting and not predicting. And you know, we have been talking a lot about, uh, I think there's been a lot of uh, uh, anticipation and discussion among investors about you know, uh, the, the recession um, that could potentially be brought about by COVID-19. Uh, I think it is um, a near certainty that you know, a, a recession would happen um, and how we should be investing. So I want to talk a little bit about you know, how our portfolios will look like if we actually try to time the market based on recessions. So the chart that I'm showing, um, there is the black line and the red line. So what the red line shows is that, you know, the returns that we could have earned if we had managed to buy and sell stocks in the US based upon the exact start and end dates of recessions. So this means that, you know, we are able to time recessions perfectly. So we know that, okay, a recession is going to happen at this date. I'm going to sell all my stocks and I'm only going to buy it when the recession offic uh, officially ends. So even if we knew these exact dates, right, and if we had bought it, right, our returns would be the red line. Now, the black line is the return we could have earned if we had simply bought and held stocks without um, thinking about this recession. And the time frame I'm looking at is from 1980 to late 2019. So it's a sufficiently long period, period of time. And we can see that, you know, timing um, our investment activities based on trying to avoid recessions actually ends up harming our returns. So this is uh, why the I think this mindset is really important that we should expect bad things to happen from time to time, but we should not be trying um, to predict them. Right. So um, if we put uh, all the mindsets together, right. So as I, as I mentioned earlier, I think it's important for all of us to be long term investors if we want to take advantage of the simple way that the stock market works, which is that a stock will typically do well over time if its underlying business does well. And but for us to be comfortable with long-term investing, the six mindsets that I mentioned are actually important because without them, we may become frustrated or we may panic when things do not go our way temporarily or when uncertainties arrive. So, and if we panic or if we become flustered, then that is when you know we actually end up uh, man manifesting bad investment behavior. So, um, but I also think that, you know, it is crucial that we do not invest for the long term blindly, because if we actually invest in poor businesses uh, for the long run, then our results will also be poor. And so this brings me to the fourth section of my presentation today, which is my investment uh, framework. So my investment framework actually consists of uh, six criteria. And I think that this uh, framework can actually lead me to companies that can grow their businesses at high rates over a very long period of time. Now, um, the reason I want companies that can grow at high rates over a long period of time is because uh, of like the understanding I have of the stock market, you know, that a stock will do well if the business does well. Um, and in fact, I look at my six criteria as kind of like traits that I want a company to have if I was able to design uh, from scratch, like my dream long-term growth company. So, like if so, if I could put in place all the different characteristics that I want to see from a company, uh, then there would be the six um, criteria that I am showing um, right here. 
So I uh, have actually published an article on my blog uh, that talks about the investment framework as well. So, you know, if you uh, miss certain things in my presentation, do not worry. Um, uh, and before I actually start explaining about my investment framework in greater detail, um, I want to stress that, you know, um, the way that I'm investing is not the only way to invest. It is not, it is also not the best way to invest, uh, but I think, you know, that it is a pretty uh, good way to invest. And so this is why I want to uh, be sharing more about uh, my investment framework. So the first thing is that I want companies with revenues that are small in relation to a large or growing market or revenues that are large in a fast growing market. Um, this is important because I want companies that have like the capacity to grow. You know, if you are in a market that is shrinking, then it is very difficult for a company to be able to achieve growth. Uh, and print advertising, uh, as just an example, is one that uh, is a shrinking market. So across the world, print advertising has actually fallen by about 2.3% per year um, from 2011 to 2018. And, you know, in Singapore, we have seen Singapore press holdings struggle with its um, print, uh, with its uh, media business, the newspaper business. And so I think it's a really good example of like the difficulties that a company has, you know, if it's operating in a market that is actually sh uh, shrinking. And this is probably why, um, you know, Singapore press holdings is trying to uh, diversify away from, uh, uh, from its core media business, you know, it's entering like student accommodations and retail malls and so on. Uh, and I think for the first criteria, it's also important to note that um, I'm looking out for trends that are powered by long-term uh, secular tailwinds. So I'm really looking out for lasting trends. I'm not looking out for that. I want companies uh, that are in markets that, you know, have like this, that, that are in very important um, growth uh, markets. So um, the second criteria that I have is that I want companies with uh, strong balance sheets with minimal or reasonable amounts of debt. Now, um, a strong balance sheet actually enables a company to achieve uh, three very important things. The first is that you know a company can invest for growth. The second is that a company with a strong balance sheet will be able to withstand tough times such as recessions. And the third thing is that you know a company will be able to increase uh, market share when its financially weaker competitors are struggling during economic downturns. Um, so there's this uh, so there's this author named Nassim Taleb um, who who um, has written the books uh, The Black Swan and Anti Fragile among others. So Taleb actually classifies organizations and organisms into three categories. There's the fragile, the robust, and the anti fragile. Now fragile things actually break during times of stress whereas robust things remain unchanged. Now, the anti-fragile um, actually strengthens as a result of experiencing non-lethal, stressful situations. So, in my view, I think that companies with strong balance sheets actually experience, actually um, enjoy a certain degree of anti-fragility. Um, so, right now, you know, we are in a situation, we are in an uh, economic slowdown that is driven by uh, measures that com that countries have put in place to try to fight COVID-19. Uh, it, it has caused a lot of pain for a lot of people. But one of the good things from an investor's point of view, for me, um, that has come up from COVID is that it enables us to actually see in real time the companies that are anti-fragile. So during times of stressful situations like what we're experiencing now, you know, we can actually see which are the companies that have business models or, or traits or characteristics that enable them to thrive even uh, while its competitors or other companies are struggling, right? Um, and I think that you know having a strong balance sheet will be a very important contributor to whether or not a company will be able to survive or thrive during this uh, difficult um, um, economic climate. So the third um, part of my investment framework is that I want I look at the management team. I want management teams with integrity, capability, and an ability um, to innovate. Um, a management team without integrity can easily fatten themselves at the expense of shareholders, uh, you know, so we do not really want that. Um, and a company that does not, is uh, with a lousy management team, or, you know, it's not, if it's not able to innovate, then it can very quickly um, be 
overtaken by competitors or run out of uh, room to grow. And we really um, do not uh, want that, right? So how do I look at, uh, how do I study a management? So, you know, what I do is I look at a company's history to better understand uh, management. F on the issue of integrity, uh, I look at how management's pay has changed over time uh, in relation to the company's business. You know, has the ma has management's pay actually increased over time while the business is uh, is declining? So if I see something like that, then I think that that is a uh, that is like a very strong uh, yellow flag. You know, I also try to look out for the matrix that management um, compensation are based on. So like some companies, they pay management based on matrix that I find to be very sensible. So things like multi-year changes in a company's free cash flow per share, multi-year changes in a company's book value per share or share price. So these are things that I think uh, aligns management's interests with me uh, as a shareholder. So I like to look out for um, uh, things like that. Um, we can also look at uh, related party transactions. So related party transactions are actually transactions that are made between a um, company and uh, uh, entities that are related to the company's uh, management. So I think that most of us uh, listening to this, uh, most of you who are listening to this uh, webinar would actually know Hai Di Lao, the hot pot operator. Um, Hai Di Lao is actually listed in Hong Kong. And, in, and interestingly, in 2018, four of Hai Di Lao's top five suppliers were actually uh, companies that were linked to Hai Di Lao's management. So this um, presence of high levels of related party transactions could actually mean that you know, Hai Di Lao's management is actually using Hai Di Lao as, the, as a conduit to enrich entities that they are linked to them. Uh, and if that is the case, then that is really not good uh, for Hai Di Lao's uh, shareholders. But I think, thankfully, that, um, or fortunately for Hai Di Lao's investors, that if we look at Hai Di Lao's profit margins, um, they've actually been very healthy. They have been about uh, more than 9% going back to 2016, which is a, a very healthy range uh, for a um, restaurant operator. Um, so on the issue of uh, capability and innovation, um, I study a company, I spend a lot of time studying a company's past actions to grow its business. Um, and so, you know, I talked uh, earlier, uh, just a slide ago, I talked about integrity. That one, that is, a, that is something that is a little bit more quantitative. Like, you know, there are hard numbers that we can look at that can give us an idea of like the, the, the character of management. Um, but when it comes to thinking about the capability and the ability to innovate, then there is something that is, I think, a lot more um, subjective. Uh, there is an element of subjective judgment that is uh, required. So I think that um, Mercado Libre, uh, uh, and, uh, and a company listed in the US that my family's portfolio has owned shares of for many years. I think it is a great example of a company with leaders who are able to innovate and also who are also like really capable of executing. So today, Mercado Libre is the largest e-commerce company in Latin America. Um, in the late 1990s, it started, um, it's, uh, it, it was founded and it actually started business by operating online marketplaces in Latin America that was connecting um, buyers and sellers. Now, because uh, in unlike in Singapore or other developed uh, economies, you know, payments, uh, electronic payment infrastructure is actually really poor in Latin America. Credit cards are not widely used. And because uh, of that, right, um, management actually started an online payment service uh, called Mercado Pago in the early 2000s. So what Mercado Pago does is it allows um, Mercado Libre to be able to handle online payments. Um, and over time, Mercado Pago has actually grown um, to, able, to be able to accept payments uh, from offline sources as well as from outside Mercado Libre's um, um, ecosystem, right? Um, and again, because of uh, poor infrastructure in Latin America, this time in shipping, uh, Mercado Libre also launched its uh, logistics solution, which is like Mercado Envios, and that was launched in 2013, the, the shipping solution. And both Mercado Pago and Mercado Envios have actually grown significantly over time. Um, and um, to me, I see it as a great sign of innovation and capability because you know you have a, you have a company that launched a really good core product, which is the online marketplace. But then it realized that there was a lot of friction in in when when it came to consumers using the online marketplace. And so it tried to think, how can I solve 
all of these friction points and how can I make the, my, the, my, the lives of my customers easier? And so it came up with like the payment solution as well as the shipping solution. And I think that that um, has helped uh, Mercado Libre grow um, for a very long uh, period of time. Um, so I spent a lot of time thinking about uh, studying and understanding management because I think that management is ultimately the source of a company's uh, competitive advantage or economic moat. So the term economic moat is actually uh, something that is uh, created by um, um, Warren Buffett. Um, so when a company is very profitable, uh, mainstream finance theory states that uh, you know competitors will emerge to compete these profits away. But there are some companies that are able to remain very profitable for a very long period of time because they have some form of economic mode. Um, and throughout the years, there have been many investors who have done a lot of work on economic modes, and they have traditionally tried, been um, trying to understand economic modes in the form of like, you know, there's high switching costs for customers. Uh, the company is a low cost producer in its market. There are strong network effects where the addition of a user to a network makes the network even more valuable for everybody that's in it. Um, then there are also um, intangible assets that are hard to replicate, such as patents and intellectual property. And then there's like a, a company being an, um, able to produce a good or service very efficiently because it has scale. So these are like the traditional forms of economic modes that uh, investors tend to understand. Now, I agree with all of them, but I think that um, management is ultimately still the source of the a company's economic mode. And that is because a company's Current economic mode is the result of management's uh, past actions, while a company's future economic mode is the result of management's um, current uh, actions. Right. So the fourth criteria that uh, I want to talk about is um, that I want I want companies with uh, revenue streams that are recurring in nature, either through contracts or customer behavior. Uh, I think that this is a very important uh, trait that many investors don't pay attention to. Um, but I think it's important because, you know, having recurring business is a great thing for a company because it means that a company need not spend resources to uh, remake a past sale. It can actually, past sales just recur. They happen year in and year out. And so what this means is that a company is able to have, have a lot of more time and resources to be able to find new ways of growing the business a company will be able to know with a high level of certainty that okay in the coming year i'm going to have this amount of revenue coming in um and i so i can plan my spending and my growth uh, investments accordingly and so i think that's a very beautiful uh, trait uh, to have for a company so i think recurring revenues uh, can come from contracts right these can come in the form of uh, subscriptions so I think a really great example is Netflix. I think that um, a lot of us in Singapore are likely to be using Netflix uh, to help us deal with uh, some of the, uh, the boredom that we are facing during this uh, circuit breaker where we're all staying home. Um, uh, so it's a service that you know you pay every month. And it, um, Singtel or, 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 or our mobile phone companies are also a very good example of uh, subscription services. No, I'm not trying to say that these are good companies, but Singtel, Starhub, M1, they, they provide a service that we subscribe to and that we pay a month in and month out. And so like these telco companies, they're able to know with a very high level of certainty that, okay, you know, I have this, uh, uh, this customer has a contract with me and he's going to continue paying for a very long period of time. And for customer behavior, I think that companies like Mastercard, like Starbucks, and like Visa are great examples. You know, we um, we buy drinks from Starbucks all the time, and we make payments uh, with credit cards from companies like Mastercard and Visa um, all the time. You know, it's something that we just keep doing, and each time we we create these actions, um, the companies actually earn a small uh, revenue from us, and so that is recurring in nature as well. So then there's another form of recurring revenues, which I also uh, find to be really interesting. And that is like the razor and blades model. And that is, I think, um, uh, a good example would be Intuitive Surgical, which is another company that I've owned shares of for a few years. Intuitive Surgical is listed in the US and it makes surgical robots. So it actually sells these robots for a one-time payment. Uh, but 
every time that you know a surgeon conducts this a, a surgery with the robot i mean the surgeon actually needs to purchase and use uh, surgical tools and accessories that are manufactured and provided by intuitive surgical and these tools and accessories they have to they have to be replaced all the time and so what this means is that um you know there's a very strong level of uh, recurring revenues for intuitive surgical and and not and and in addition the company also gener also earns um recurring maintenance revenue so the robots have to be maintained and that is something that um uh, intuitive surgical earns uh, on a recurring uh, basis so about 70% of the company's revenue actually comes from recurring sources, such as the tools and accessories, as well as uh, the maintenance um, revenue. So the, um, the fifth thing that I look out for in a company is that I want companies with a proven ability to grow. Um, so, you know, there's this um, disclaimer uh, that is often used in investing, that is the past performance is not a uh, indicator of future performance. Um, and I completely agree, the past performance is not a perfect indicator of a company's future performance. But I think it is a really good indicator because winning businesses tend to have a momentum that lets them continue to keep on uh, winning. So I tend to look out for companies with strong track records of growth. And I'm typically looking out for companies with um, you know, big jumps in revenue, uh, net profit, and free cash flow over time. Sometimes I think just having revenue and free cash flow is good enough. Um, but I am generally very uh, wary of companies that are able to produce revenue and profit growth without being able to produce uh, growth in free cash flow. Sometimes there are also companies that are able to produce revenue growth but suffer a lot of losses um, and or generate negative um, free cash flow. Because I know so ca cash is actually the, the lifeblood of a company. And so if a company is able to show like a lot of profit, but yet still, um, you know, it can still run into financial trouble if it's unable to produce much free cash flow. So, you know, um, we have this company in Singapore named uh, Noble Group, which is a commodities trading company. It was once a darling in the Singapore stock market. It was once a blue chip. But over the past uh, few years, um, you know, the company has actually gone uh, bankrupt, uh, effectively bankrupt, and cost shareholders a lot of pain. So what's interesting about Noble Group is that if you look at its financials, um, it actually was able to produce profit for a long period of time, but it was unable to produce much cash flow at all. So the company actually ended up becoming a, a, a huge problem for investors because of this inability to generate um, cash flow. But you know, all of this um, said, I'm actually happy to be able to make exceptions for companies that are currently generating losses and burning cash. You know, if they are um, doing this to pursue growth. Uh, but the important thing is that I must be able to see that there is a clear path to profitability and strong cash flow production for these companies for me to be able to feel some sense of comfort. So um, like currently to, in today's market, uh, companies that I think uh, fall into that category would be software as service companies. Many of them are currently making losses or not generating much cash flow, but I'm still comfortable with some of them because I, I can see a path to very high levels of profitability and cash flow uh, for them. So that gives me comfort in, in wanting to um, uh, invest uh, with them. Yep. And the last uh, um, thing, I, uh, the last criteria I want to talk about is that um, I want companies whose business models give me confidence that they can generate a strong and growing free cash flow in the future. So, you know, there's a very simple theory in finance that a company's value is simply the sum of all the cash that it can generate over time from now um, to the day that the company ceases to exist and we discount that cash back to the present. So the more free cash flow that a company can produce, I think the more um, valuable uh, it is. And there are some companies where free cash flow is lumpy, such as uh, project-based uh, companies. So I tend to avoid these types of companies. So I think that you know there's a um, a good example in Singapore's market would be Samcorp Marine. Um, Samcorp Marine builds oil rigs and and runs shipyards. Um, and you can actually spend months or even years uh, building an oil rig or, or or a ship. And in those months or years is it actually spends um cash that are related to like salaries and raw materials 
uh, and like you know just the work needed to to build uh, the 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 oil rigs and the vessels. And so Samcorp Marine is spending all of this cash upfront. And the cu com customer sometimes pays only when the project is delivered a uh, long time later. But you know what if the customer cannot pay at the end of it all because uh, you know the the cash has actually already been paid for all these expenses and so for me i think that that is a very bad um business model to have for companies um in terms of being able to generate uh free cash flow so uh for companies like these i tend to um uh want to avoid them yep so um how i actually use um this uh the, the investment framework that i have so i believe that the companies that can excel in the according to my uh, investment framework would actually be worthwhile investments for the long run uh, but i also have to stress that you know uh, even such companies can also turn out to be very poor investments um uh, it is impossible for us to get it right all the time investing like in my case in my old family's portfolio we have also have many uh, big losers and i actually wrote about this uh, in the blog itself in one of my recent um, articles so for me personally i think that a good number to have uh, would be 30 to 50 companies in the investment portfolio from uh, that is and 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 this uh portfolio and all these companies should come from different um, industries and diff and be operating in different um, geographies. Um, it's uh, I believe that you know every investor should be investing in a way that gives them the most comfort. Um, so I'm not comfortable investing in just a small handful of companies. So um, but at the same time, I'm so very careful about uh, over diversification because I think that um, having a uh, a um, portfolio that's only made out of a handful of stocks uh, uh sorry uh, having a portfolio that's made out of many stocks will actually dilute um my my returns so um some of you may also be wondering how can my investment framework protect uh our portfolios so i i, I want to be very clear and it is that the framework cannot protect uh, my portfolio from short-term declines in stock prices during bear markets or recessions. You know, I, I, I explained earlier that bear markets and recessions happen every now and then. They are inevitable, but um, they are also not predictable. Um, so the it's important also, I think, to note that bear markets can happen without recessions. So uh, even when the economy is doing well, a bear market can happen. So for this reason, I don't bother with protecting my portfolio from price declines. Um, uh, even when the economy is doing well. So how I protect my portfolio is that um, I want to protect my portfolios from recessions, right? Um, because during a recession and the economy isn't doing well, and that means that the chances are higher that uh, companies will run into financial trouble. So my investment framework right, actually leads me to companies with like the following characteristics, you know, there's strong free cash flow. There are there is a robust balance sheet. There is a high level of recurring revenue, and there's also really good and honest and capable management teams. So I think that companies with such traits or such characteristics, they are actually very well equipped to survive or even thrive uh, during economic downturns. So this actually protects the true economic value of my investment portfolio. Um, over the long run. So this is how my investment framework helps to protect uh, my portfolio. So um, I am now in the last section of uh, the webinar, uh, which is that, you know, um, how can we find investment opportunities during this COVID-19 crisis? Um, I, I cannot speak for everyone, um, but for me, I am finding investment opportunities during this crisis simply by sticking to my investment framework, right? So my, my framework is built on the, the fundamental attributes of the stock market being a place to buy and sell pieces of a business and of stock prices being um, governed by their underlying business performances over the long run. And what COVID-19 has not done is that it has not changed um, this fundamental 
identity of the stock market, which is that it's a place to buy and sell pieces of business. You know, COVID-19 has been a very painful time for many people. There is a lot of economic pain. There's a lot of human suffering. But the very important attribute about the stock market is unchanged. And I don't think that that will ever change. I don't think that any recession from COVID or, or what COVID actually does to the economy, I don't think that changes the fundamental relationship in the stock market, which is that it is a place to buy and sell pieces of a business. And so I, I am still sticking with my investment framework, um, which uh, and, and my framework is uh, sticking with my investment framework so that I can able so that I'm able to find companies that I think will be able to uh, grow over a long period of time. Now, what COVID nineteen may have changed is that it may have caused certain industries to growth prospects to change. So, for example, industries that were previously uh, that had pre that previously had like really bright growth prospects, I may have to change my views on them. So, for example, like if you talk about online travel. Um, I own this uh, shares in a company called Booking Holdings, which is the largest online travel agent in the world. Um, I Before COVID-19 happened, I had a lot of confidence in the growth of the online travel market and the growth of Booking Holdings. But you know, now with COVID-19, a lot of countries have shut their borders. Uh, they have um, prevented people from flying in and out of the country. So this has actually severely, um, this has uh, severely, uh, uh, damaged uh, the global travel industry, including the online travel market. So, you know, um, and who knows how long this, um, the, the pain will last for the online travel market. So this has caused me to re rethink my investment thesis for like the online um, travel market. So this is a way I think that, um, that COVID-19 has changed things. Um, it does not change like the, the fundamental underlying ways of uh, finding investment opportunities but like it just changes like i think the growth prospects of certain um, um industries um and i think you know we we also have to uh realize that you know there has been unprecedented market volatility during COVID 19 um in february and march you know we saw tremendous uh ups and downs in the stock market uh the, the in fact like um the in in February and March, there was the fastest ever decline, um, fastest ever 30% decline from peak to trial uh, for the S&P 500 uh, going back like uh, over the past uh, 100 years, right? Uh, but what I want to say is that, you know, volatility has always been um, present in the financial markets. If we go back to 19, October 1987, the U.S. stock market actually declined by more than 20% in one single day. You know, and as a result, um, 19 October 1987 became known as Black Monday. But you know what's interesting is that stocks have still actually done really, really well over time. Um, so just some very quick data. So, you know, um, the, the, the U.S. market had actually already declined by about 10.1% in the three days uh, preceding Black Monday. So in the span of four trading days, from the close on 13 October 1987, 19 October 1987, the S&P 500 had already declined by about, uh, had declined in total by about 30%. And yet, you know, from 19 October 1987, sorry, 13 October 1987, which is before Black Monday, to 31st March 2020, the S&P 500 had actually increased by around 900% in total, and that is about 7.4% per year. And over the same period, I also want to point out something very interesting. It is that the earnings per share of US stocks actually increased by 6.7% per year. So, you know, the input of 6.7% has actually led to an output of 7.4% over more than 32 years. So this is a very similar kind of input-output relationship to Berkshire Hathaway that I mentioned at like near the start of this um, um, presentation, right? So um, another thing about COVID, you know, is that yes, there will be a lot of um, economic hardships for many countries around the world. And, and this is unavoidable. I think that some countries will be hit even harder than others. Um, and some companies uh, will be hit uh, even uh, harder than others. But there will also still be companies that will be growing their businesses and markets that will still be enjoying very powerful long-term tailwinds. And it is our job as investors to be able to find 
um, these companies. And I, tr and I think that, you know, if I use my investment framework, I'm able to find such companies. And I also want to point out that, you know, um, I want to end this webinar and on an op optimistic note. And that is that, you know, these economic hardships will also end um, someday, right? You know, there are, I, Jeremy and I, we are long-term optimistic about the stock market. And um, there are about 7.8 billion people in the world today. And the vast majority of us will actually wake up every morning thinking about you know, how can I improve the world and how can I improve my own fortunes. And this, 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 this motivation right, is actually what ultimately um, grows the global economy and financial markets. Businesses are created to solve problems, to improve the world. And so, you know, there, there are bad people around the world. Then there's also mother nature. You know, these things can actually cause a lot of problems for us over the short run. And, you know, we have seen this with COVID-19, which is like um, a, a kind of a natural uh, disaster in a way. But, you know, I, I have faith that um, as humans, we are able to solve these problems and that, you know, any mess that comes up, we as, hum as, as people, as, as humans, we will be able to solve uh, problems. And so to me, right, investing in stocks is actually ultimately the same as having faith in the long-term good of humankind, uh, in the believing in humankind's potential and ability to innovate and all the good things that, that we have as, as people. So to me, investing in stocks is ultimately the same as having that same that, that belief. Right. And, and I think that so long as um, I continue to, to have this faith, um, I will be um, optimistic about stocks. Um, of course, the, the only exception is when stocks become crazily overvalued, as it was the case in Japan, like I discussed um, a bit earlier. So uh, with that, I have come to the end of the q uh, Sorry, I've come to the end of the uh, webinar, and I think it's time um, to do the Q&A. Um, and as a reminder, um, Jeremy and I, we will be posting this presentation um, on our blog, The Good Investors. So um, thank you for, for listening. And um, Jeremy and I, I think we are, we are really excited to be able to start answering um, questions. Okay, wonderful. Thanks a lot, Sergin. Can you hear me? Yes, I can, I can. Uh, okay, wonderful. So uh, Jeremy, you also unmuted your mic, right? Hi, Jeremy? yeah. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. So uh, everyone listening in, uh, can you please, uh, if you're not inside the webinar room, uh, please join us inside the webinar room if you're watching on YouTube and if you have some pressing questions to uh, ask uh, Jeremy and Sergin. And for those of you who are already inside the webinar room, you can go ahead and scroll down below the video or somewhere on your screen, you will find a chat box where you can type in your questions to ask uh, Jeremy and Sergin. Okay, I think uh, after sitting through this one hour of uh, uh, Sergin sharing, well, my brain feels very warm. It brings me back to my <laughs> school days. <laughs> like after a very intense uh, lecture by my lecturer uh, to what uh, really feel to the brain, man. I think you. You have uh, spent a lot of time to put together this very condensed session for us. And I really like to thank you for it, uh, Jeremy and Sergin, uh, to share with us your uh, mindset as well as the investment framework. And it is uh, also, we are also very thankful and grateful that you are, we are having this being recorded uh, so that you can share this same content with uh, many people who are unable to join us tonight. Okay. Yep. So, uh, uh, we are waiting for the more questions to be typed in uh, by mm -hmm. all the attendees. Uh, please go ahead and type in in the chat. Uh, don't shy. Uh, got what, anything just wag. Uh, this is the chance. Okay. So while waiting for the questions to come in, maybe you could uh, help me with a few questions I have jotted down while I was listening to you. Sure. That's okay. Good. Yeah. Oh, just uh, interesting statistics. <clears throat> uh, <laughs> I was observing who are the attendees. Uh, tonight. Although majority of uh, you attending are from Singapore, we also have attendees from Malaysia, Australia, Hong Kong, Germany, Ooh. and even Fiji. Uh, we know wow. the guy from Fiji la, because he's stuck there with work. Okay. <laughs> <Intake>. <laughs> uh, how, 
I hope that uh, okay. people, so, uh, uh, great. you can join us from all over the world, you know. So yeah. uh indeed uh this uh, investing mindset and framework uh cut across all countries, okay? And yeah. uh now uh the questions I want to ask is that uh mm. from from what I gather, right? Do you guys use TA technical analysis at all? Uh not at all. Um, we are very much focused on businesses. Uh, we, uh, so like I, I, I like to call ourselves a business focused uh, investor. So like we do not use technical analysis. I'm not saying that it is not a good tool. I think it's very important for people to invest um, um, according to their skill sets, according to what they know well. Um, so for us, uh, we know what we know well is that we um, are able to analyze businesses well. Um, able to uh, think about the long term um, and adopt a long term framework uh, for looking at markets and businesses. So uh, that is why we uh, invest uh, the way that we do. I see. Okay, thanks for the answer to that. Uh, my next question is that uh, in the current market situation, it seems like the worst is over, you know, or it is dead cat bound. So what's your view? Do you think the worst is over? Do you think this is going to be a V-shaped recovery? Uh, Jeremy, you want to go first? Then I can chime in. Um, it's very hard to, to say what whether the market is priced to perfection now. Uh, I think there's too many uncertainties that that we, like the um there are too many uncertainties in the market like um we don't know whether there will be uh what's the economic full economic impact of the virus um we don't know how long this virus will take whether there will be a second wave of infections uh so it's really too difficult to say um that's why i think we shouldn't focus on predicting what will happen in the near term or we should think about what will happen um four or five years down the road rather than try to think about what can happen in the next quarter or two. I see. So would you say that your, what would you say would be your, you know, preferred holding period for your, you know, whatever is in your portfolio, four or five years or, or like Warren Buffett forever? I think for uh, me, would, yeah, yeah, it, oh, okay, no, for no. me, I think it would be like, Five years will be the minimum. So uh, five years, anything longer than that is preferable. So 10, 20 years would be even better for me. Um, I take a very, very, very long-term approach. So um, so yeah, five years is the bare minimum for me. Yeah, so um, so Richard, you mentioned about uh, Warren Buffett's uh, uh, famous quote about his favorite holding period being forever. Um, and I think that that is really the right way to approach. Uh, but there's also a caveat in, the, uh, in that um, his favorite holding period is forever, but Buffett also actually buys and sells quite a bit. And the reason is because I think it's uh, important for us to be um, buy to hold investors and not buy and hold investors. So there's a difference between these two, like, um, uh, uh, for lack of a better word, mindset. Buying buy and hold mean, means that, you know, you just buy and then you hold it blindly. Whereas buy to hold means that, you know, you buy it, but you're aware and you're keeping up with developments and you're, and you're aware that, okay, is this company's progress, um, uh, in, in, is, is it progressing in a way that I think uh, that, I, that I had uh, imagined earlier? So um, for me, I invest for the very long run, but I, I, I invest with a buy to hold mindset. Um, I'm also looking at multi-year time horizons, uh, five years or more. Um, I, I started investing in October 2010, a lot of the stocks, as I mentioned during the webinar that I bought in 2010 and I bought in 2011, 2012, 2013, I still own all of them, um, or rather most of them. Um, and I am, and both Jeremy and ourselves, we are very hesitant to sell actually. Um, so what I mean by buy to hold in the context of he being hesitant to sell is that, you know, we, we buy a company, we observe it. If it isn't good, right, then it, or it, has, it has performed in a manner that we think uh, is not up to par or then we will not add money to it when, as we grow our portfolio. We would not allocate additional resources to it. And the reason why um, I personally have also been very reluctant to sell is because I want to develop this important discipline of letting my winners run. So one very important aspect of my portfolio management philosophy is that I let my winners run. You now, people often say that, you know, uh, you want to buy low and sell high, right? For me, I'd much rather buy, and, buy low and never sell. Because good companies, 
uh, they can go on growing their businesses for a very long period of time. People often ask me, what is the next Amazon? What is the next Netflix? But very often, the next Amazon or the next Netflix is Amazon and Netflix, right? So like good companies can actually go on to grow their businesses for a very long period of periods of time. So um, that I want to let my readers run and to develop that kind of discipline. I think it's important uh, for, for me, at least, you know, to, to really have like this discipline to not want to uh, sell uh, very much at all. So um, that is a very long rambling answer to what is a very short question. <laughs> 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 uh, he's pregnant with wisdom and gems, you see, and coming from two <laughs> thirty-year-old guys, you know. So that's really amazing. I wish uh, I had your kind of experience and knowledge. So you say you started investing in two ten to eleven, uh. October so twenty ten for me. Wow, that means 20, 23, 24, like that. Yes, correct. I was twenty four. Yeah, you and already then... have the knowledge. At that point in time that you dare to start pulling triggers i i actually started learning about investing when i was 17 or 18 years old i was in national junior college uh, i took economics as one of my subjects one of the four subjects in, in in junior college and i thought that all the i i thought that what was being taught was wrong all the basic assumptions underlying the economic theories were wrong they do not reflect reality so i wanted to find out more about money from people who actually worked with money so that was how I discovered like Warren Buffett and uh, his friends and his um, mentors. So I started reading like books that were written by these people or written about these people. And um, all of them talk about, you know, looking at stocks as a piece of a business and thinking long term. So like that message actually resonated with me. Um, so um, that has very basically been the way I've been approaching investing. Uh, ever since I, I I started, because I think that it is very logical and it allows me to also live uh, a life in the way that I want. Uh, like this kind of long term investing that I do, you know, I don't need to stay up at night to monitor the markets. Um, as I understand, as I own a company over a long period of time, it becomes easier and easier for me to understand um, like its latest results. So like keeping track of its business developments also become very simple. I don't have to spend a lot of time trying to understand the company. So um, it is a uh, it is a way of investing that uh, I think suits me personally very well. I see. Wow, seventeen. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think seventeen. Or 18, yeah. <laughs> is that where you met Jeremy? Yeah, uh, class yeah, yeah. We were yeah. we were not we were not um, classmates, but we we had I have a classmate who is Jeremy's really close uh, secondary school friend. Uh, so Jeremy, you also started back then? Uh, I started after uni actually, so I'm a bit slower than surging. Uh, so after I graduated from, from Australia, I came back, I did an internship in a hedge fund. And after that internship, uh, that's when I really started investing my own money. Wow. So that was 2000, 2013, yeah. Hedge fund. 2014, yeah. I see, I see. Okay, that's uh, interesting insights to know your background. So no wonder by age 33 already so much experience, you know. So, okay, so thanks for that answer. Now, do you guys um, use options in your portfolio or just long stocks? Do you all short? Do you all use options? Um, no. Yeah, we, I think, uh, both of us don't short stocks or don't use any form of derivatives. So you're just very plain vanilla kind of investors. Uh, just so don't leverage. Long, long, no leverage either. So ah. only long stocks based on the money that you that you have available. Right, right, right. Yeah. Okay, I will. I better stop asking my questions, although I still have. Before, uh, sorry, Richard, before you go on, I have a very interesting um, thing that I want to share about shorting stocks. So I think that um, it is a lot easier to identify stocks that wouldn't do well as compared to shorting them. Um, so like there's this investor in the US named Jim Channels um, who runs the Kiny Cost Fund. Um, Channels has a reputation as one of the world's best short sellers. But the very interesting thing about Channels is that his main fund, Kiny Cost, is actually made out of two sub funds. One is a leveraged long-only fund investing in passive um, vehicles like mutual funds. 
uh, sorry, not mutual funds, index funds or index tracking ETFs. And then the short portfolio uh, is basically going out there to short stocks. But um, Kiny Cost exists because the, the short portion, the short sub fund is able to allow uh, Kiny Cost to leverage on the long side. So the short po portion is actually really just to uh, provide a tool for channels to be able to go long on passive investment vehicles. And now the amazing thing is that from the inception of uh, Kiny Cost, I think I think Kiny Cost started maybe in the 1980s or something. I cannot remember the exact number. But from, from say the 1980s to like 2017, Kiny Cost actually declined in value by about 0.2% or something like that per year on average, right? So this is like, Channels has the reputa has a reputation as one of the best short sellers in the world, but his fund, the, the main fund that, that is, excuse me, that's trying to short stocks has actually has actually lost money over over a very long period of time. So I think this gives, I think a very good example of like how difficult it is to short stocks. So like you know your question was asking, do we do options or, or leverage or um, uh uh. Uh, shorting. So the answer is no. Uh, like Jeremy said, we are very plain vanilla investors. We just want to do things that give us the highest chances of success and that um can and that we know well. Yeah. Yeah. I think also shorting stocks is betting against the market because the market tends to go up over time. So if you are shorting stocks, you you are already at a disadvantage because you are betting against the the longer term trends of the market. Yep. Great point. Uh, Great, thank you. Thank you for the answers. Okay, um, I have a few pressing questions that I'll just like to finish off. Huh? So now that mm. you say that you, you buy stocks and you buy to hold, when mm -hmm. do you know that you should no longer hold them? I mean, do you watch them every day? And then you don't look at chart, you know? So you're no. basically <laughs> based on the financial reports that come out every quarter, then you kind of make a decision. So you don't even look at the chart, right? Mm. So when do you know that um, no, no longer want to hold this anymore? Uh, Jeremy, you go first. I think maybe there could be a few reasons that you might want to sell. Um, one is if your investment thesis has changed. So if there's a fundamental change in a company and, and the, the company is no more fundamentally a company that you want to, to invest in for the long term. So that could be one reason. The second one could be... Um, a sudden spike in the price that the, the valuation just doesn't make sense anymore. Um, and the third one, possibly, third reason possibly could be just if you need the cash to, to I mean, obviously, um, as investors, we don't, want to, we don't want to invest cash that we will need in the short term. So hopefully nobody needs to sell uh, their stocks because they need the cash. But uh, if there's a, if you need the cash to allocate into a better investment, then that could be one of the one of the reasons why you might want to sell, but 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 from generally we don't want to set, we don't want to sell stocks. We try to hold them as long as possible. Oh, so so, so I can share. Yeah, I, I can share like my own personal experience. Um, I had so I've been investing uh since October twenty ten. I own 50, uh, the portfolio has about 50 companies, um, but I have only ever made two voluntary sales um, of like oil and gas companies. Um, the reason why I sold them is because I believe deeply in something that uh, the Motley Fool's co-founder David Gardner once said, and he says that, you know, you should be building your portfolio um, according to the uh, best vision you have for our future. So for me, the two stocks that I sold were oil and gas companies because uh, for me, my future, my, my the, the vision I have for the world in the future is that one that is powered by uh, clean renewable energy that does not harm the environment. So I wanted to sell my oil and gas companies because uh, like they no longer reflect that um, vision that I have uh, for the future. So by and large, I have not made any other voluntary sales. Um, of the companies that I own. So like for me, the, the, I think the most pressing time I would sell would be like when I actually need the money, when I need the money to buy something. Uh, that, that, that's the only time I would consider um, like selling my stocks. I, I see the stock market as a savings account that can help me generate uh, a much higher level of return as compared to an actual savings account. I see. So are you more of a capital gain investor or a dividend investor or is dividend important to you at all so for me um for me i would say i have both 
capital gain stocks, stocks that tend to don't don't pay a dividend, and uh, the earnings that I get is purely from capital appreciation. And I also own uh, stocks that pay dividends. So I I I think I'm a, more of a quite a mixed kind of investor. Ah, yeah, for, okay. for me, I don't see any uh, difference at all. Uh, I'm all about looking out for good companies. If a good company is paying a dividend, that's fine. If a good company is, isn't paying a dividend, that's also fine. So like, I don't pay any attention to whether or not a company is paying a dividend. I'm really looking out for um, uh, good companies. I see. Okay. Now, just now you mentioned you have like 30, 50 stocks. So how do you, do you do you have equal allocation to them and then you rebalance them? Or do you, you know, skew towards certain sectors or companies that you like and you buy more of it? Uh so this this will depend on like how the portfolio started uh it um starts off being built. So like um in the way that we my family has built the portfolio is that uh, we started off with a small sum of money and then we added keep adding kept on adding money over time. Um each increment has been about the same dollar amount in value. So what it means is that uh, we have actually been purchasing like a roughly similar dollar value in the shares that we have. Um, so like there is no real, um, like we cannot really play with the weight too much because like there's just this sum of money coming in and this is what we're going to be investing. Uh, but we play, I managed to change the weights in a way by, you know, um, adding more capital to an existing company over time. Um, I also let my winners run, so I don't really do much uh, rebalancing. At, uh, in fact, no, I don't do any rebalancing at all. I, I, as I mentioned, I let let the winners run. So, like some companies may have started out as like a one or two percent position in the portfolio, but because of like massive capital appreciation, has gone on to increase uh, like ten or twenty times in value and then become like ten percent of the portfolio. So, I have quite a number of cases like that uh, within my um, uh, family's portfolio. Yeah. I see. Wow. So the uh, 50 stocks is a lot of uh, you get do you get very busy during the earning season? Mm, no, not 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 really because um like I mentioned, you know, the longer you own a company, the uh the, the easier it becomes to to keep track of the company's performance. Um and also because uh before I invest in the company, I have done most of the legwork up front. So like when it comes to just keeping up, uh, keeping track of like what's going on, it's not that difficult. Yeah, not sure about right. me. <laughs> okay. Last question. Then we'll go and address all the questions that our attendees have uh, put in. All right. So do you average down? Let's say you you know you 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 have the company. You know the company business is good, uh, but for some reason their price is being punished like this COVID thing. You know. So mm -hmm. do you pick it up at better price? I think for me, um, it, it depends on the portfolio construction. Uh, if you already have a, a large percentage of your portfolio in a certain stock and you still want to add more uh, and, and, and the stock has gone down and um, it may not be that great an idea to, to, to average down because then your portfolio gets heavily weighted onto that particular stock and um, you, you, then, then it becomes a, a risky kind of a like a risky portfolio with too too much concentration on single stock um, but at the same time um, if you if you have more capital and you can afford to put it in a in a stock that has fallen and to increase your allocation and the allocation in that particular stock is not yet that large then by all means um, average down averaging down can be a good a good idea especially if if you believe in the stock for the long term Right. Thank you. Thank you for answering my questions. So shall we now click on the moderation tab and see the questions that our attendees have asked? Okay. Some of uh, maybe I'll answer the first few simpler ones first. Now, for those of you who just join us or they can't stay for the whole session, not to worry. This uh, webinar is being recorded, and uh, it will be on the YouTube 
and it will be on the goodinvestors.sg blog. It will be embedded there. And I will also send out a link to the replay for those who have registered. Okay, so you, if you want to attend everything again, uh, by all means, uh, use that. Okay, so uh, Sergin and Jeremy, do you want me to pick the questions or do you want to pick the questions to answer? Uh, how about you do that, Richard? <laughs> okay, all right. So let me see. Huh? Okay, see chart. Ah, okay. So do you, okay, Samuel asks, based on the current USD rate against Sing, what's your advice do you have on investments in US equities at this time? Uh, um, we ha I have no views at all about currency movements. It's something that I know that I'm not good at, so I never spend time thinking about uh, currency movements. Okay, I spend a very little bit of time thinking about currency movements. My view toward currencies is that um, eventually, you know, if you're if you're investing in a country with a relatively stable economy and relatively stable um, uh, uh, politics, then and if you're investing in a good company. And I think um, over time, you will still end up with like really good returns. Uh, at, back then at the Motley Fool Singapore, you know, we actually did studies on like Malaysian stocks. And, and we know that, you know, the Singapore dollar has done very well against the ringgit. But if you actually bought some, a uh, few of uh, certain Malaysian stocks um, back, like say in the 80s or 90s, when the ringgit was much stronger compared to today, uh, you have still done very well in Singapore dollar terms because these were, those were good companies. So I think ultimately the focus should really be on like, um, in that finding good companies to invest in and then just let the currency thing um wash themselves out yeah they tend to um not matter uh that much over the long run i think as current I mean, assuming, yeah yeah i think currency can have very mixed effects on on companies so like a lot of the u.s companies um even though they trade in the u.s dollar um they also earn a lot of their revenue from global economy so a lot of them have um global businesses that uh, and earn money in in Asia, emerging markets, etc. So, um, currency movements can work for and against them at the same time, even though they trade in the US dollar. Right. Okay. Thank you for that. And uh, now, question from CY. Uh, he or she is asking, how could we obtain such information as in a company's revenue in relation to the total addressable market size for that? category or segment i suppose can you want to go um so for us companies a lot of this information can be found in their uh in their annual reports 10 10k or even in their prospectus um so you can dig up that, that information um from from management's um, input in this in these documents Ah, I see, uh, I see. I will I will add that like sometimes it's really just trying to Google. Uh, you know, like you find an interesting looking company that's operating in a uh pretty interesting market, and then you can Google like um what is uh what is this uh, market size? You know, sometimes company does not talk about it at all, but you can actually Google. Like for example, uh, I just uh, wrote an article on one of my holdings. It's a restaurant company in the US. Um, so like I had to estimate the size of the market so i had to go and google uh, so i compare like its restaurant count with like how many subways there were in the us how many mcdonald's there are in the us um what is the total spending uh from diners in the us and all that so uh i would say that the internet has is basically the way to find this information we have to know how to use google well to be able to find uh, the information that we need Right, thank you for that. And Andy asks, how do you keep track of 30 to 50 companies in your portfolio? Do you use Excel or there's a special software? Or um, so I, I think I talked about this a bit earlier. Also, like, you know, like how it becomes easier over time. So I, I don't use any, I, Jeremy and I, we don't have any special software that we use. It's really just um, uh, keyboard and the Microsoft Word document. <laughs> <laughs> Not even Excel. Uh, yeah, Excel, yeah. So keyboard, oh, Excel. Yeah. Uh, good old pen and paper way. Yeah, yeah, the digital pen and paper. Got it, got it. Okay, Vivian asks, the slowdown in the travel industry could only be temporary. 
So uh, over the long term, the situation should return to normal. So if that's the case, would uh, companies like Booking Holdings be a good long term investment, you think? So this is just my personal take on like a holding in my in, in the in my portfolio, right? So um, I am very much leaning uh, against that view. In, uh, I, mean, sorry, I very much agree with that view in the sense that uh, like the travel situation because of COVID-19 is likely going to be temporary. Now, the only um, risk is that um, if the shutdown is uh, happens for a long time, say maybe two years, maybe three years, then will, uh, will a travel company be able to survive? Now, that is, I think, the more important question. Like, what to, um, to enjoy the upswing when the crisis ends, you need the company to be able to survive uh, the, the downswing. Yeah. So I think that is like the key question. Like, and, and I think that this is, uh, this will be very different from very different companies. Like even within the travel space, uh, online travel space, you know, two, the two largest are Expedia and Booking Holdings. And then you also have like Airbnb. Uh, Airbnb recently had to go and borrow um, uh, money from investors at like, I think 10% interest rates, uh, which are like incredibly high. And then Booking Holdings is borrowing at only about four or 5%. So you can see the difference in there. So uh, yeah, it's a very, um complex situation no one really knows so like uh for me the way one of the key ways that i protect myself against uncertainty is also to diversify yeah. i see thank you for that okay so oh, this one called handsome uh, handsome you're in he asked that in your opinion are there any areas or businesses where customer demand will change permanently because of COVID and therefore affect the company fundamentals Jeremy, you want to give a shot? Um, I think in a positive way, uh, COVID might accelerate technology adoption. So things like what we are doing now, webinars, Zoom conferencing, uh, video conferencing, um, telecommunication, um, teleconsultation for doctor appointments and all this kind of stuff. Um, this kind of technology adoption might actually be accelerated and permanently improved or permanently adopted over because of COVID-19. Um, that's from a positive standpoint of how COVID-19 is uh, uh, creating these kind of uh, behavioral changes. Um, from a negative standpoint, I, I can't think of anything now. <laughs> Maybe Sergin can chip in. That. No, I, I, have no, I have nothing to add. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no problem. Thanks for that answer. Okay, Steve is asking, um, he's saying that uh, he has a similar way as your framework, but what he finds difficult to accept is that many of the stocks before this crash uh, was in such a high valuation. Still can buy, man? Or we okay, have to wait um, and show hand or something like that. So, uh, I, I, I love this question. Um, so, there is... Uh, there, there is a stupid price to pay for any company. Like at a certain price, even the best company becomes a very lousy investment, right? So like in general, like there's a bargain price, I uh, hope I can see on the screen, bargain price, uh, fair price, and then like a stupid price. Now, the thing is that I think people, a lot, a lot of investors don't realize is that the gap between the fair price and the stupid price is actually really wide. Um, so one of the, my favorite, um, Things that I remember about my time at the Motley Fool is that I once wrote an article about this company called Walmart, which is the largest uh, retailer in the US and one of the largest in the world, maybe the largest in the world. It's a bricks and mortar uh, retailer. Uh, so kind of like um, uh, like a supermarket operator. Um, so, you know, if, uh, so I wrote this article in 2014 and the article is like, you know, if you were to go back to the 1974 and you were to invest in, and you wanted to earn a 15% annualized return with Walmart in 1974, how much would you be willing to pay uh, for, for Walmart um, in terms of the, the price to earnings ratio? And the answer turned out to be more than 150, 150, right? And so if what it means is that if you actually gone back to 1974 and you paid 150 times earnings for Walmart, you have to earn a 15% compound annual rate of return for 40 years. Um, and a 15% compound annual rate of return of 40 years would basically make you one of the legends in the investing business. So I think that, you know, if you find a good, the, the right company, the good comp a, a really good company, um, you can pay what seems to be an expensive price 
and yet still be able to do very well over a long period of time. Right. Well, thanks for that. <laughs> okay. Now, the next question comes from, um, let me see, Kent. And he said that, uh, hi, Sergin, do you think that Amazon and Viva in your portfolio have been priced to perfection and hence too costly to acquire now? Um, I mean, I obviously cannot give any uh, investment advice. All I can say is that I'm holding on to their shares. And uh, like, I think that they are definitely on the pricier end. But does again, no, I go back to my point about, about Walmart, right? Does, but so does this mean that um, they will not be good investments uh, over the long run? I don't think so. Because uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happily holding on to them. Right, thanks for that. Okay, Garnish asks, would Tesla be a stock that would, you know, meet the your framework or your criteria? And uh, whether do you think it's a value buy now? Uh, it's very, um, we cannot really be giving any uh, such uh, uh, investment um, um, recommendations or advice. So what we only what what we can do is just to share like our thoughts. Um, so for me at least, uh, maybe after I share my thoughts on Tesla, and Jeremy can chime in if he has uh, things to add. Um, Tesla, I think I, I really like Elon Musk as an entrepreneur. I think he's doing phenomenal things for the uh, for the for the for the world, uh, trying to make the world a better place. Um, and, and I and I don't see any other entrepreneur putting in as much effort as he as he is in terms of trying to make the world a better place. You know, trying to um, bring the world into the, the era of electric vehicles and clean energy and so on um, and trying to help us become a civilization that can actually inhabit multiple planets and I think that is like something that is phenomenal um, but there are also a lot of uh, uncertainties I think in, 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 in the company I would love to see Tesla succeed I own a very small stick in Tesla because I used to own shares in this uh, uh, company called Solar City, which Tesla acquired uh, through shares so I ended up holding a very small stick in in um, Tesla. So I'm I am rooting for the company, but you know um, there are and, and when I talk about uncertainties, it's really about like the the balance sheet of the company and the capital intensity. Uh, cap, sorry, capital intensity of the of the of the business in terms of uh, producing cars. Um, then again, uh, I might be wrong about about Tesla, and uh, I so I would actually put Tesla into my uh, too hard pal. So uh, Warren Buffett has this, uh, in Charlie Munger, they have this um, uh, pal of uh, three trays. They call it one is a too hard pal, one is a yes, one is a no. So like when they see something and if they don't really understand or they find it too too difficult to comprehend, they put it into the too hard pal. So Tesla as of, the, as of this moment is currently in my too hard pal. Yeah, I'm still trying to uh, uh, figure it out. <laughs> right. <laughs> and their uh, truck looks really cool too. Like a space. Uh, oh yeah, space. beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> and I heard the demand for that truck is really off the off the charts. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Okay, the next question is um from Chris Ng. Um, he is asking uh, on the framework on management. Do you use the founder owner management criteria, and uh, how do you feel about this criteria in terms of the importance in investing in a business? Um, I think it's important, uh, but I, I don't think it is like all important. Like there have been, uh, okay, I'll give you a, a great example. Like uh, if you look at a company like Chipotle, for a very long period of time, it was led by its founder, Steve Ells. Um, Chipotle is a, a restaurant company in the US that makes, uh, uh, Mex that serves Mexican food uh, and has, uh, it's a long uh, has been a success for a very long period of time. Um, okay, it IPO'd in 2006 and has done phenomenally well for its investors uh, because of uh, tremendous growth in its business. Uh, so Steve Ells was its founder since uh, uh, the company was founded in 1993 and Steve Ells led the company as CEO all the way to 20, early 2018 and then became executive chairman and then he stepped down. Now, um, the problem was that at uh, uh, in 2015 or so, Chipotle ran into some food safety issues while Steve Ells was leading the company and Steve Ells couldn't solve it. So in the end, he had to step down. He stepped down graciously to his credit. And in came this person named Brian Nicole, uh, who before Chipotle was at Taco Bell as CEO. Um, so he, uh, what Brian Nicole managed to do is to bring in a lot of the really good uh, operational 
um, things about um, uh, fast food chains and to improve Chipotle's business while still keeping all the things that Chipotle was, uh, that, that still made Chipotle special. So I think there are cases where, um, where you know, the founder may no longer be the best person to lead a company. I, I naturally gravitate towards companies that are led and managed and, and run by founders. I, I really like it because I think that they have more than just money in the game. They have skin, not just skin, soul. I call it soul in the game because they, um, it's their baby. They, they, they want to see it succeed. Um, but I also recognize that, you know, it's not uh, always the case where the founder will be the right person to continue leading a company forward. Yeah. Right. Thanks for that. Thank you for the answer. Okay. I'm just looking at the questions. Huh? Okay. Yeah. So let's say you have uh, done your research and have your, okay, this question is by KK. Okay. You have uh, hmm. done your research and you have your watch list. Do you just buy or do you, you know, how do you make your entry? Um, certain ratio or certain things or or quarterly, since you don't use charts, you know, so how do you plan your entry? There is a very, there's, is, there's nothing scientific about the process. It's often a lot of qualitative, uh, subjective judgments. So it's kind of like I have, like when it's time to invest, when the money comes in, um, there's like a whole list of companies I'm looking at. Which one do I, am I the most comfortable with at that point in time? Um, which one has like the most attractive, um, profile when it comes to the risk and reward um so um so it's it's a it's just a list of like very squishy subjects there's no like hard and fast rule that that determines when i actually um that uh when i actually invest in in a company but by and large most of the time if i find a company that i think that i know has tremendous opportunity for growth um okay so when i when i look at a company's growth right i also think about growth along two dimensions. One, the first is the opportunity, the size of the opportunity. And the second dimension is the probability that the company can continue growing into that opportunity. So every company will fare differently based on these two dimensions. So what I'm, sometimes uh, like um, once in a while, you find this really rare company that does very well on both fronts. Typically, you know, you have companies that do very well on the opportunity dimension, but not so well on the probability dimension. That is more often the case. Um, and sometimes you have the very high probability of uh, doing very well in the probability dimension, but like the growth opportunity may not be that uh, good. So it's weighing these two things most of the time um, that helps lead me to the decision as to, okay, which company should I, do I want to um, invest in um, at that point in time? I see. Okay, good, good. Thank you for that. Okay, Greg is asking, um, great presentation, guys. Um, what do you do to calm yourself during those panicky periods, you know, when your brain is telling you, wow, you're losing money, maybe you should sell, you know, how, how do you calm your nerves and say, hey, hang in there, man? Jeremy, you want to go first? Um, I think it's important to, to, when you first start investing, to have the mindset to know that there's, there will be times where your portfolio is going to take a hit. So if you, if you start off investing with that kind of mindset, then um, when your portfolio does go down, you have anticipated it, you are prepared for it in a sense. Um, and at the same time, you shouldn't need the money to, you shouldn't need the money at the point in time. So that prevents, that allows you to, the holding power to hold on during these times of this, this, these steep drawdowns where styling will be detrimental to your portfolio. So for, for me, right, it is, it is a question that I have also spent a lot of time thinking about. I always wonder, you know, is this, is this emotional stability something that can be taught or is it something that is inborn? Um, and I have not come to any conclusion yet. Uh, but what I would say is that if it is inborn, I think I am, I have been quite blessed to have been born with that uh, gene to be able to not feel these ups and downs um, because um, I actually don't feel much emotions uh, when I am investing. Even during like the recent uh, huge uh, uh, volatility that we saw in, in February and March, I did not really feel anything. Yeah. So I, I don't think that's a very satisfactory answer, but it is like <laughs> what I'm thinking when it came, in trying to answer the question. Yeah. I see. 
<laughs> okay, interesting answer. Okay, next question is from Chris Ng, and he asks us, does Chinese internet or e-commerce stocks listed in the US like Baba, Baidu or JD meet your investment framework? What are your views on their transparency and corporate governance? Jeremy, you want to go first? Um, I, I own Alibaba stock, so I, I actually am quite bullish on the e-commerce market in, in China and, and what Alibaba is doing with the whole cloud computing sector as well. Um, in terms of corporate governance, I think, I mean, yeah, China has, has a reputation of having a very shady corporate governance, especially with now with uh, Luckin Coffee, the, the big scandal there. And, but so far, I think Alibaba is one of the companies that have been under major scrutiny and I think it's very hard for them to have a lot of, um, I mean, it's hard to say, but a company the size of Alibaba could um, will unlikely to have uh, uh, corporate governance issues, especially if they're listed in America. Yeah. So, so, um, yeah. So very quickly, I think uh, they these uh, Chinese internet companies. Uh, I think they they do fit the criteria quite well. I do like some of them, but I also have concerns uh, over corporate governance. Um, they. I, so how I manage for such risk, right? Like if I were to be running a portfolio, uh, would be to size them appropriately. So maybe like the Chinese internet companies would get a smaller weight in the weightage in the portfolio as compared to uh, say their counterparts in the US, for example. Yeah, and then uh, and but but I, I'm one thing that really would um kind of like control the weightage that I give to Chinese companies, especially internet companies, is the fact that um when you own shares in a Chinese internet company, or in fact if you own shares in most Chinese list, most China companies that are listed outside of China, you actually don't own um the actual shares in the company. Uh, you own what is known as a variable interest entity, VIE. So this is the VIE structure, right? You actually own some shell company that has had signed an agreement with the actual company that says that all your profits and revenues and so on would go to that shell company. And so that is what is what investors are actually owning. It's the same with Alibaba, with Tencent, with JD.com, um, all these companies. Yeah, you're owning, you're owning a variable interest entity that is actually a shell uh, that is based in, I don't know, like the Caymans or something. Uh, that has a contractual agreement with the with the with the uh, uh, parent company. Now the the thing about this agreement is that it has never been tested in Chinese courts. Uh, so um, you know, when push comes to shove, we don't really know um, how these contracts will, will, will they be honored. Um, so that is, I think, the 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 the, the greatest uh, risk. Uh, I recognize that you know there's a lot of economic wealth that's tied to this Chinese internet company. So the the Chinese government will likely not want to play too much games with with the VIE structure. Um, but you know you 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 never really know. Yeah. And so if something happens to that VIE structure, your your investment is effectively wiped out. Yeah. So so there is, I think, something to be said about portfolio sizing when it comes to um, Chinese internet companies. Right, thank you guys. Okay, next question. Uh, uh, let me see. Uh, yeah, your views uh, on using dollar, uh, dollar cost averaging to buy, you know, to scale into a position for a company or one lump sum in and then be done with it? Okay. Um, personally, I prefer to just one lump sum in and, and be done with it. Um, I, it. It depends on on your sizing as well. So if you're going, if you have, um, if you have a small, if you have a small portfolio, then dollar cost averaging can be very costly in terms of transactional cost. Um, but if your portfolio is much larger, then dollar cost averaging can 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 be beneficial, uh, especially if you hit the minimum amounts per transaction. So. And it also depends on um, your cash flow at the time. Like uh, dollar cost averaging works for people with consistent monthly income. So every month they, they save a bit and then they, they dollar cost average into the into the stock stock market. So that that works perfectly with the cash flow that they're getting for them from their income. Yeah. So I think for, for me, my my answer would be that um it is uh studies have shown that um on, uh, that lump sum investing statistically has proved, shown to be, have better performance as compared to uh, DCA, the dollar cost averaging. 
Uh, but we also have to take into account the fact that uh, we, we humans in general are emotional creatures. So um, DCA is typically uh, a method of investing that uh, enables us to sleep better at night. And I think that one of the most important um, things that an investor should be doing is that it should be, he or she should be investing in a way that lets them sleep well at night. Yeah. So um, if DCA enables you to sleep better at night, then DCA is the, is the, is the uh, more appropriate um, uh, method. Right, thank you for that. Uh, I, YH, I hope that answers your question. And then the next question comes from uh, YS. Uh, he or she is asking whether we should be actively investing, like what you're doing, I think, or participate passively via an ETF. That's a great question. Uh, I, I can, uh, Jeremy, I'll answer and then maybe you can chime in if you have thoughts. Yeah. Um, so I think that uh, for, um, I think for most people, uh, okay, so I think first is that the investor needs to, the, the individual needs to ask, you know, like, do I have the interest and the ability and, and, the, and, the, and the time? You need these three things to be able to want to invest uh, actively, right? Without any of these things, especially without interest or without ability, then you should really be doing it passively. And I think that passive investing actually is a, is a, is a great thing uh, for, uh, there's been a lot of advancements being made in passive investing um, uh, over time. Uh, like in Singapore in recent years, there have been more and more of these robo-advisors that have been coming up. And I think that a lot of them actually are doing fantastic things for investors. They are lowering the cost of investing for investors and also giving them access to uh, really good uh, funds that were previously uh, not available easily. So I think um, that uh, the, you know, it's really a question that the individual needs to answer. Uh, him or herself, that am I really interested in doing this? Do I have the time? Do I have the energy, the, the capability? And also, like, more importantly, the ability. Yeah. So, like, it's a, uh, I don't think there's a one size fit all um, answer. Yeah. Yeah, I think it has a lot to do with interest because um, if you're interested in, in learning about companies and stocks in general, then active investing will be naturally a good fit for you but i mean for most people who just want to who just want to invest and but they don't want the hassle of digging through company reports and reports quarterly results then passive investing would probably be the much easier option right thank you thank you for that okay next question is uh probably a few people have asked similar ones so i'll just lump them together do you just mm. invest in you know, counters, or do you also invest in other countries, like maybe specifically Singapore, for example? So I can only speak from uh, uh I'll speak for myself first, and then Jeremy can can share his. Uh, I I for my family, I only invest in um the the U.S. market, yeah, because uh I find that so I think in investing is also important to go to fish in ponds where there are more fish. So I think like for the way that I think approach investing and the way that I think about the markets, uh, the US um, has uh, a lot more fish as compared to like say in Singapore. I mean, just to give you an analogy, right? I talked about Chipotle earlier. Uh, it has about 2,500, 2,600 restaurants in the US. In Singapore, I think the, the largest, uh, uh, like McDonald's and Starbucks are probably the largest uh, F&B brands in Singapore. And they each have only about 100, between 100 to about 120 to 150 outlets each. And they have already like more or less saturated the whole of Singapore, right? So I think this is like a microcosm of like the difficulties that companies have in being able to grow uh, in Singapore. And the, the, you can say the irritating thing about uh, Southeast Asia is that if you want to expand out of Singapore, then you got to, then the easiest, the nearest route would be to Southeast Asia. But the problem is that Southeast Asia is also many, many different markets. Your strategy for growing in Malaysia is going to be very different for growing in Indonesia or growing in Thailand and so on and so forth. So. I think it's just much harder. Whereas, like, it, say in the US, or um, it is every every state is different, but there is still a common, very uh, there's still a lot of very common underlying um, similarities. So, I, among the people uh, living across the United States, so I think there is a um, it's just easier for companies uh, to to grow in the US as compared to say in Singapore. Yeah. Yeah, I think there are much there are many more growth growth stocks in the US compared to Singapore and Southeast Asia, uh, just simply because they have much larger market, a much more homogeneous market and 
it's easier to sell across different states rather than sell across a, a region with so many people are, uh, with so many different cultures and different um, customer behaviors. Right. Okay. Thanks for the answer. So, okay. There are a few questions about Singapore REITs. What's your view on Singapore REITs? I mean, if oh, you don't hold Singapore stocks, then... Uh... Oh, actually, I own REITs as well. <laughs> I own REITs. Yeah. You think uh, Singapore REITs have, uh, you know, is it worth to look into or also don't bother? No, I think REITs are... REITs can be a good investment, uh, especially REITs that have um, stable, strong portfolios that, because REITs are very stable, income generating assets, asset classes. They, um, rental is very steady, recurring income. Um, but the only problem is in, in a situation like, like now where um, there can be tenant defaults um, um, and there can be cash flow issues for the REITs. And because REITs are highly leveraged, entities so uh, they might run into uh, cash flow issues and have problems paying up their interest or, or renewing their debt so this can be a problem for REITs but in general I mean in good times or in normal times REITs tend to be REITs have tended to do pretty well in Singapore I think right okay thank you so SJ you have anything to add to REITs nope nothing to add Wonderful. Okay, so that's about all the questions we have. There's another few questions from a few individuals asking about your compounder fund, more details about it. When is it coming out? So what should they do if you don't, they want to find out more? Uh, can you can always uh, go to our uh oh so like in the in the slide that I am at now uh which is the share screen um there's the contact so like can always drop us an email uh the good investors at gmail .com. so yeah. Or you can go to our blog, and there's also uh, an uh, like a, a a page within our blog where people can send messages uh, to us. So yeah, we are more than happy to share more about uh, the fund um, in in one on one conversations. Uh, we are very excited about it. It's a it, it is more than just a business for us. It's a way for us to be able to um, build a really good investment solution and also to help as many people as we can um, in Sing in Singapore. So uh, yeah, we are very very excited about it and. Um, very happy to share more if people are interested to find out. Okay, wonderful. So for those few persons who asked about the fund, please contact uh, Jeremy and Sergin through the email that is on the screen right now or via their yep. blog at thegoodinvestors.sg. Okay, another question from Chris. Now we're going to wrap up in the next uh, few minutes. Uh, we'll sure. take a two questions, okay? So for Chris, uh, mm, who asked, uh, they would, he would love to hear your <laughs> a company who share buyback. Are uh, share buybacks a positive or negative thing to your decision making? I think Jeremy wrote a really good article about, about share buybacks uh, fairly recently. So uh, maybe Jeremy on to go first. Um, yeah, so uh, share buybacks is just a way for companies to return money to shareholders. So it can be a really good thing because if you buy, you buy back the shares, you reduce the the number of outstanding shares that a company that a company has, um, so it actually increases the pie that shareholders own. So um, that's a great way for companies to return shareholders' money. But at the same time, if they're doing it with debt or they're doing it with cash that they need for their business, and then that can that can really um, cause a short-term uh, cash flow issue for them. So that's what we're seeing in uh, airline stocks and uh, some other companies that are that are running into some cash flow issues at the moment because of the COVID crisis. So I think share buybacks are, are good, but they need to be managed in a way where it doesn't hurt the balance sheet so much and it, and, and, and it done, is it, it's done in a sensible way, where, not when shares are overly priced, but when, sh when, the, sh when the company shares are actually uh, decently priced. Or undervalued. I see. And, okay. and yeah, and also um, another thing to add: share buybacks can be better than dividends because dividends are taxed in the US. So by by buying back shares, you're actually re returning shareholders' money at a more tax efficient way. Wonderful. Thanks for the answer, Jeremy. Okay, another question here. 
uh, from B Yang. He said, hi from an ex Motley Fool SA member. Which, which are the few US stocks that are still meeting your investment framework despite the uncertainties created by the COVID situation? Uh, you mean uh, like the uh, old recommendations from the Motley Fool Singapore? I, if that is the question, I don't have the list uh, uh, with me now, so I, 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 I cannot remember most of them off the top of my head. Uh, it's been quite a while since I bought more than, more than six months since since I left the the, the company. Um, so uh, I think the only one that I remember very clearly is uh, uh, Amazon. We probably recommended Amazon if and yeah, I I, uh, I wrote about Amazon fairly recently on my blog and I think that um, it is amazing seeing what the company is trying to do now to help America during this uh, COVID-19 crisis. Uh, it recently hired 100,000 workers um, and then went on to, to uh, look for 75,000 more workers. So basically during this entire COVID crisis thus far, Amazon is going to be hiring 100, 175,000 additional workers. So that you know, um, it has now become like a really important, nearly like an infrastructure in the US. Um, a lot of uh, Americans now actually depend on Amazon for um, meeting their uh, basic necessities. So like food and, and medical equipment and stuff like that uh, delivered on, uh, buying online and then getting it delivered. So um, yeah, it is one of those companies that I think is also slightly anti-fragile, I think. Uh, and that the crisis is kind of like showing that uh, um, that Amazon is perhaps a truly anti-fragile um, company. And um, in a way, it's also lucky uh, because um, that a lot of this, uh, uh, its business is actually basically built to absorb all these important accelerating trends that are happening because of COVID. Like, you know, there's a lot more of these, like Jeremy mentioned earlier, adoption of technology, uh, uh, particularly clock computing. So like services, that are, uh, software that are delivered over the internet. And then that plays really well into, into Amazon's one of Amazon's core strengths, which is uh, the Amazon Web Services business (AWS). Right, it's the largest uh, cloud computing infrastructure provider in the world. Um, and so it's just companies. It's just this COVID nineteen is just like this crisis that is playing in uh, into all of Amazon's strengths actually. Yeah, so so it's uh, it's it's a pretty amazing company. Right. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. I think that's all the questions and time that we have. We have overrun for 15 minutes. I feel, I hope that it's been uh, worth it for all the attendees that are still with us today. So uh, any parting words for the audience before we end off the webinar? Uh, Jeremy and Sergin? I just want to thank everybody for taking the time to, to join us today and hope everyone is staying safe. Yep. Same here. Like just very thankful that um, the, we have this opportunity to share and that like, uh, we hope that uh, we have added uh, value for, for the listeners during this uh, the two hours that we have, two hours plus that we have spent. Um, so yeah, and, and I also hope that, you know, this whole crisis will uh, end soon so that everybody's lives can uh, become a bit better. Right. Thanks so much for your last words with our attendees here. And uh, just a quick uh, reminder for everyone who have not subscribed to the mailing list uh, to the goodinvestors.sg to go ahead to their website, their blog to register so that whenever Jeremy or Sergin were to write any articles and analysis, you'll be one of the first to know. Okay. And with that, I'd like to thank everyone for staying behind to attend this webinar. Thank you, Sergin and Jeremy for putting in so much effort to prepare the slides as well as answer the questions. Uh, our for pleasure. Our right oh, so all the best and please stay safe and have a very good night and i'll see you at the next webinar bye 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 everyone, bye, everyone.